Hello there, this is Joe Reinhardt, and this is a demo for my Cisco CCNA wireless training course from TrainSignal. One of the other aspects of lightweight access point networks is the ability to be able to build redundancy into the system. If you have autonomous access points, it can be a little bit more difficult. But we wanted to look at different types of redundancy because it's a word that can be used and not always understood. So we want to be very, very specific about how we define it. So doing that, we're going to look first at access point redundancy. How can we take care of this at the lowest common denominator in the system? Next, how to be able to establish redundancy with various wireless LAN controllers, essentially multiple wireless LAN controllers. And then finally, some additional things that don't always come immediately to mind when dealing with wireless networks, but are also an important part of establishing redundant connectivity and so forth with this entire infrastructure. Let's begin with access point redundancy. This actually has to do with coverage. Essentially, you see in the graphic to your left, smaller circles with solid lines and larger circles with broken lines. This is essentially one way that a controller-based system really can handle redundancy. In this case, if there were three access points serving a particular area and the access point at the bottom actually ceased operating, the wireless LAN controller could boost the power levels on the remaining access points to be able to mitigate coverage temporarily in the hole that might be in that particular spot. So they might normally operate at a lower power level and then temporarily be increased in order to be able to continue to provide coverage. Good design for wireless networks requires access point fields to overlap. This takes care of things like seamless roaming, but it also helps with the situation we just described in terms of power levels. It's especially true with voice networks. Voice networks you're typically going to have to have a denser amount of access points closer together in order to be able to adequately support the voice environment. And again, if, if an access point fails, we can increase power temporarily. So this is a way of being able to do access point redundancy. Now something that might seem not quite so obvious and not something that you would expect on a certification exam is actually understanding how to be able to handle if you have an access point failure. Cisco SmartNet is essentially Cisco's extended warranty on components. And there are typically two approaches that customers take. The first is they buy the SmartNet. Now, there are several different levels of smart nets when it's related to hardware. When you get into software such as, you know, communications manager, it's much more complicated. But for access points, it's very simple. There are three levels. There's eight by five by next business day, meaning if there's a failure of the access point and it's in a business week and you make the call, you'll get it within the next business day, provided you've contacted them during business hours. So it'll be on its way out that next day. Eight by five by four is typical business hour operations, but a four hour replacement. And then finally, sort of the highest and premium is the 24 by seven by four, which means that any time that access point fails, you will be able to get a replacement within four hours. Now, it's a good news, bad news. Eight by five by next business day is inexpensive. Each one level gets progressively more expensive. If you have some specific areas in the network that's very important to have that kind of coverage, then so be it. I've also seen some customers that with access points, Cisco IP phones, and some essentially outlying units, they actually will have a certain number of replacements on hand. So for instance, if in this particular diagram, if, if you had three access points deployed, you might keep one as a spare. If one fails, you'd be able to put the other one in service, obviously get the other one replaced, but then you wouldn't, you wouldn't be down for long. And obviously using a controller, you could have the identical configuration and firmware downloaded to that. So access point redundancy is actually critical because that's essentially your first line that users interact with the system. Wireless LAN control redundancy actually takes a number of different forms and there's some specific terms I want you to be familiar with so you can understand how this works. Typically, it's called N plus one controller redundancy is the one first level. And essentially, this is the process of taking and having APs registered with multiple controllers. There's a primary, a secondary, and a tertiary. You can actually have them register with three in sort of descending order like this. For N plus one redundancy, as illustrated in the diagram, access points register first with a primary wireless LAN controller for normal operation. For instance, you see in each one of these, the access points on the left are associating directly with a primary wireless LAN controller. This is normally an access point wireless LAN controller relationship on a local site. For instance, 
the access points that are installed, for instance, at a facil one facility, and the controller serving those access points would be in the same building or certainly in the same campus environment. But then they register with another that doesn't necessarily have to be within that data center or property or location. It could be remote across a wide area network. So the access points register with this secondary wireless LAN controller in case the primary fails. Now, this can be really good because you built in some additional redundancy. But the bad news is, if that particular wireless LAN controller, if both the primaries fail, if one fails, fine. If it's able to pick up the slack. But if both fail, it might not be able to handle all of the traffic from those other access points. So you could end up with an oversubscription issue, or you could end up spending a lot to be able to have enough licenses on that to have it back it up. So essentially, you're having one secondary controller backing up a number of other primary controllers. That's N plus 1. N plus N is a little bit different. These, again, the APs register usually locally with the primary controller and then there's another local controller at a perhaps a different location or handling a different group of access points that's ac that's the secondary there are two groups here the top two access points on the left primary controller is to the right secondary controllers down so essentially these down the page so essentially these access points are backing each other up so to do this correctly you have to make sure that you have enough licensing and capacity built into each one of those to be able to handle all of the network in case one of the other ones goes goes down. It's it's a great system. It could involve greater expense because you essentially end up having capacity and licensing that you hopefully are never using. And that could, you know, essentially be looked at as a waste of cost. So it's a much more bulletproof way of looking at it, but it can be more expensive. So N plus one, N plus N. And then there's a combination of the two called N plus N plus 1. In this case, you have the access points, as before, registering with a local controller. They then register with another controller that's essentially backing it up, just like the N plus N that we talked about a moment ago. But then, just in case there is a third or tertiary wireless LAN controller that will back it up in case of failure of the rest of these controllers. You build in the additional capacity, and you know hopefully it would never all have to fall over to the tertiary wireless LAN controller. You have the same problem you did with N plus one, but this is another way of being able to take it to a greater level. And again, the disadvantage could be you know perceived as an unnecessary expense or greater expense. So N plus one, N plus N, and N plus N plus one controller redundancy. Some other ways to be able to deal with redundancy has to do with things that are not just on the wireless network. You can have wireless access point redundancy to a degree. You can have controller redundancy. But there are other things that you need to be able to make sure are built into the rest of the network infrastructure to support a truly redundant model. Some, for instance, dealing with device access or something called lag or link aggregation that's available on certain models of wireless LAN controllers that have multiple ports. There's also path redundancy, the path between the wireless LAN controller and maybe the access points of the wireless LAN controller and some of the rest of the network, you need to have redundant links. This is something you would have been dealing with on your CCNA with things like ether channel, port channels between switches, maybe multiple internet connections. And obviously you also need routing redundancy because there's the layer two aspect of redundancy with things like ether channel, but then there's also your routing redundancy, being able to make sure that you have multiple equal cost paths in the case of failure of one of the primary. And then finally, there's what's called business continuity or disaster recovery, where in the event of failure at a primary location, there's another off-site location, sometimes it can be a secondary data center or disaster recovery center, that can pick up operations in case of failure of the primary. So these are some infrastructure pieces that don't always come to mind when you're talking about redundancy, but you need to make sure are part of the mix. Thanks for watching. For more information regarding our training, please visit www.trainsignal.com.